Good morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Welcome. Our forums are free and open to the public every, and are every Sunday at noon at the church at 4700 Grover Avenue. For more information about our public affairs forums, you can go to our website at www.austinuu.org. Today, I'm honored to have a, a superb speaker, Tom Doyle, and he's speaking on Texas and the Gay March Towards Full Citizenship. Um, he's talking about the long march of gay people in Texas towards full and equal citizenship, and he's been involved in one capacity or another in this uh, movement for fuller civil liberties for lesbians and gay men for over 25 years. He was one of five plaintiffs in a state court challenge to the constitutionality of the Texas sodomy law, Morales versus Texas, in 1989. And uh, ultimately, the uh, Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, took a Texas case and uh, resolved that issue for once and for all. Tom Doyle is a retired attorney. And let me tell you a little more about him. Uh, he's a fifth-generation Texan who lives and writes in Austin. He has two degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, a Bachelor of Science in Communications, and, he's, of course, he's also an attorney. He founded Liberty Books, Austin's first and only gay and lesbian retail bookstore, in 1986. And he was one of the five plaintiffs in the state court challenge to the Texas <coughs> sodomy law. Um, he practiced law for 32 years before retiring in 2001. He writes short stories. He's a past president of the Writers League of Texas. He's won prizes for his Austin Chronicle short stories, and his stories have been read at the Dallas Museum of Arts, Arts and Letters Live program. He's a past recipient of the Texas Civil Liberties Advocate of the Year Award. Let's give Tom Doyle a warm Welcome. Thank you. The name of the talk today is Texas and the Gay March Toward Full Citizenship. But I need to give a little background before I can get to Texas. And because I like you people, I'm going to start this at the end of World War II and not with Alexander the Great. There will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so if something occurs to you, remember it, write it down, and we'll try to address it at the end of the talk. Each of you will receive a piece of paper called Selected Annotated Sources. And it just describes three of the books I'm going to talk about in one of the law cases in case you're interested in this material and would like to read further. World War II ended in uh, 1945, and there's a fairly recent book out called Eminent Outlaws, The Gay Writers Who Changed America by a gay novelist named Christopher Bram, and this is his first nonfiction book. And his thesis is that the writers, the American writers following World War II who began to write about gay and lesbian experience created a foundation for gay rights. Before this time, there was no language that could be used in public to discuss the matter. And we'll talk more about that later. But let me name a few of the writers so that you'll get a sense of who they were. Now, two of the writers I'm going to name are English, but they were living in the U.S. at the end of World War II, and they're part of this group. W.H. Auden, Christopher Isherwood, Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, James Baldwin, Gore Vidal, James Purdy, John Retchie, Edmund White, Felice Picano, Larry Kramer, Andrew Holleran, and I will stop. But that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people writing about gay and lesbian experience. And his thesis, Mr. Bram's thesis in this book, 
<clears throat> which he explores at book length and supports, I believe, I've read the book, that the beginning of the gay revolution was in fact a literary revolution, that that's where it all began. And then in 1948 in this country, we had the publication of two books that made a huge talk throughout the country. One was uh, Kinsey's Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, and then the other was Gore Vidal's The City and the Pillar, a novel. And both of them were scandalous for the time. For one thing, they both created the impression that homosexuality among males was more common than originally believed. So that was a controversial notion. And then in 1950, the junior senator for Wisconsin, Joe McCarthy, was speaking at a Republican women's meeting in Wheeling, West Virginia. And that's where he stood up, waved a piece of paper in the air, and said, I have the names of 205 communists who work in the State Department. That kicked off a whole uh, period of repression and fear. A few weeks later, an undersecretary of state named John Purifoy said, the State Department has allowed 91 homosexuals to resign. Now what we saw in McCarthy's statement was the Red Scare. About six weeks later, the Red Scare became the Lavender Scare. The assumption was that gay people were treasonous, traitorous to their country. And that was not questioned much. Very few people found that a scandalous idea. So what happened was a purge throughout federal government of men and women who lost their jobs, thousands of people in every department. And then you ripple out one layer beyond that to all those defense contractors, especially on the West Coast, aircraft manufacturers and other defense installations where security clearances were required to work those people got fired if they were gay and lesbian because their security clearances were revoked. So it was a huge deal. It sounds like it would be of limited impact. It would bother a few people at the State Department, but it very quickly rippled out, and so it had a national impact. Now, the advantage of this, what's the silver lining? Well, repression creates the opportunity for opposition. And that began to happen. Later in 1950 was the founding of the Mattachine Society by Harry Hay and Rudy Gernrick. And the Mattachine Society was a national homophile organization. <clears throat> Harry Hay was a labor organizer on the West Coast. Rudy Gernrick was a uh, female fashion designer of, of, of women's clothing, and he was from Austria, and he, if you look him up, he's famous for the women's topless bathing suit. So that was his great, that was his great contribution to, uh, to fashion history. But these two guys founded an organization of gay men. They recruited them off the beaches, in Southern California and in the bars, everywhere they could think of to go and started to found an organization. And the, the word Mattachine comes from a medieval French court, Matochos were fools in the court who could speak to the ruler with impunity. So that's where the word Mattachine comes from. So then in 1955, was the founding, founding of Daughters of Belitis by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. And it was a homophile organization for women. And Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon were among, were the first couple to marry in San Francisco when 
marriages first became legal for gay and lesbian people. So they've been together more than 50 years. It was very uh, sweet scene to see them. One of them was in a wheelchair and they were able to marry. So we see these two homophile organizations and basically they're putting out newsletters and building a mailing list. Uh, they're not uh, setting the world on fire and they're very careful to maintain a low profile, to try to avoid arrest and persecution of various kinds. Then in 1952 was the, the publication of Kinsey's Behavior and the Human Female and a wider discussion of the Kinsey scale. The Kinsey scale posited that there were, uh, that human sexual behavior ran along a spectrum, exclusively heterosexual, exclusively homosexual, and a number of more fluid positions on that spectrum between the two. So that was a, a huge uh, deal. In 1957 was the, pu the publication of the adjustment of the male overt homosexual by uh, Dr. Evelyn Hooker. And what she was talking about was that homosexuality should not necessarily be considered a mental illness. All the studies that had been done before her time, all the research that had been done before her time, had been with groups of mental patients and prisoners. <laughs> so she went out and found a more general population of self-identified male homosexuals and said, these people can adjust to life just fine. So it was a controversial idea, and, but it was out there in the world in a scientific publication. And also in 1957, published in London, England, was the Wolfenden Report, uh, which was a, a British governmental study which posited that private consensual homosexual conduct should be decriminalized for various reasons. You'll have to read the report to get the whole thing. It was a huge study. And only one person in the commission voted against that. Then in 1961, the first gay rights case was filed in the United St States Supreme Court. Why? How? Well, in that purge of the government, a man named Frank Kameny who was an astronomer at the United States Army Map Service, got fired for being gay. And instead of slinking away, which was the customary mode of behavior, he sued. He sued the federal government, which uh, at the time was unheard of for gay people to sue the government. And he went to the United States, the case made it all the way to the United States Supreme Court in 1961. He lost. But I will tell you, because I know the rest of his life, the government messed with the wrong faggot. He spent 60 more years fighting oppression of gay and lesbians. And he, before his death, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. He's now deceased. Frank Kameny also sponsored the first gay rights march at the White House in 1965. <clears throat> he had a dress code. He wanted to make a good impression. Uh, he required men to wear suits and ties and the ladies to wear heels and dresses. He also invented the slogan, gay is good which he uh, got from Black is Beautiful. I mean, it was a black civil rights anthem, Black is Beautiful, and he thought, we need one too, and he came up with Gay is Good, and that got used for a number of years. June 22, 1969, now we're coming along. Judy Garland dies in London from an accident, 
accidental overdose of barbiturates. And whether or not it was accidental, that's how it's reported. Why do we care? We care because Judy Garland was an icon of a gay community. And six days after her death were the Stonewall Riots. June 28, 1969. What are the Stonewall Riots? And they're now referred to as the founding of the modern gay rights movement. And what the Stonewall Riots were, in those days, the gay bars, in New York City at least, were mostly owned by criminal syndicates, the mafia. And there were seasonal raids on these businesses, mostly coinciding with election season. It's time to run for city council. Let's go round up some faggots and show we're cracking down. So a typical raid occurred on the evening of June 28th, 1969, at a bar in Greenwich Village called the Stonewall Inn. Now, the Stonewall Inn was kind of a low-end bar. There were a lot of uh, street hustlers, homeless people, miners, drag queens, uh, the people who were least likely to find acceptance hung out in this bar. You didn't find many middle-class white gay boys. They weren't there. So the police made a raid that night, and they, in the usual routine, went into the bar and lined everybody else up and started checking IDs and pushing people around, and they called for a paddy wagon, and they were dragging people out in the street and putting them in the back of the paddy wagon. Because what happened, generally, on those occasions, is those people were taken to a police station and their pictures were taken, their names were taken, and then often, not universally, but often, their names were published in the newspaper. And they were fired. They lost their jobs. It was a great scandal for being caught up in the raid of a gay bar. This sounds barbaric in our modern free-thinking time, but we're only talking about 1969. It's not, we're not talking about 1869. It, this happened fairly recently in our, our lifetime. <clears throat> What's different about Stonewall? For the first time that prompted national attention, because it may have happened in San Francisco and Los Angeles before, but it didn't get national attention. For the first time it got national attention, gay people fought back. They didn't just line up and routinely take the abuse that was handed out to them, especially the drag queens. And uh, it started off far fairly lighthearted, the protest. There was a chorus line, a kick line, of men in the street chanting, we are the Stonewall girls, we wear our hair in curls, we wear no underwear, we show our pubic hair. Kick. <laughs> so uh, it was a fairly lighthearted thing, and also chanting at the police, your shoes don't match your purse. <laughs> <clears throat> so... But as, as it wore on into the evening, into the night, people began to throw penny, pennies at the cops, dirty copper, pennies. And then it escalated from pennies to bottles and bricks. So it began to escalate. And a crowd began to gather because it was in a gay neighborhood in New York City. A crowd began to gather on the streets uh, not just the people who were in the bar, but the people from the neighborhood pouring out there watching. And a, a, uh, a lesbian, who a Diesel Dyke, who was being drugged away to the paddy wagon, turned to the crowd and said, why don't y'all do something? Well, that was just the spark that the tender needed. It was a conflagration. 
the police to escape the anger of the crowd went into the bar to try to barricade themselves in for protection until reinforcements could get there. There's some speculation by some reporters that there was a, a problem with police radio that night. So they were in there using the bar telephone trying to get help. The crowd tried to set the bar on fire. And they were burning trash cans in the streets, overturned police car. It was a real moment of civil disobedience, a real moment of social unrest, and highly unusual, and a total surprise to the police, you can be sure. So that's Stonewall. And, the, and those riots ran for three nights, the first night, second night, and third night. So it, it wasn't just a momentary blip. It was an end of an era. It was an end of people lining up to be abused and waiting for the blows to fall. It was vastly empowering to every gay man and woman who heard about it in the nation. And it got reported in the New York Times. So it was na a national news. Okay, in 1973, the trustees of the American Psychiatric Associated voted to remove homosexuality from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. The DSM is the uh, list of diagnoses used by mental health professionals to render a diagnosis about people's mental illness. And this decision was made in part based on the work of Dr. Evelyn Hooker, whom I told you about before, whose work was published in 1957. Only took about 18 years to do it, 15 years. But it got around to it, to take it out of the DSM. And then in 1974, the full membership of uh, the American Psychiatric Association ratified the trustee decision. We come now to Texas at long last. In 1983, there was a case in Dallas called Baker v. Wade, a federal case. And uh, Don Baker was a school teacher at the Dallas Independent School District. And Henry Wade was the longtime district attorney in Dallas. And Don Baker was also head of the Dallas Gay Alliance. And he brought a suit alleging that the Texas sodomy law was unconstitutional. And this suit was heard in the courtroom of Judge Jerry Buchmeyer. The lawyers among you know that Judge Buchmeyer, for years, wrote the humor column for the Texas Bar Journal until his death a few years ago. Let me say a word about sodomy laws. There have been sodomy laws for hundreds of years, and usually they apply to everybody. The sodomy law in Texas only applied to same-sex behavior. That's different. Not everybody, just same-sex behavior. And it was in the nature of a legislative resolution where the legislature says, we don't like your kind. We don't like the sort of person you are. Because there were seldom, really never, prosecutions under the sodomy law. What does that mean? That means it could never be challenged. It was there. You could lose custody of your children. You could lose visitation rights to your children. You could lose employment. But you couldn't challenge it because there were no prosecutions. I was later involved in a case that challenged the statute. 
We went to the police station first to say, we'll sign confessions if you'll prosecute us. We, we couldn't get a prosecution. Couldn't get it. Nobody would do it. Anyway, so in Baker v. Wade, Judge Buchmeyer agreed with Plaintiff Don Baker and said, there's no rational reason why this person's liberty interest in conducting their intimate life ought to have unreasonable interference from the government. There's no rationale for it. And then it was appealed to the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans and lost at the Fifth Circuit. Advocates of liberty lost. So then there was an appeal to the United States Supreme Court. Well, and this is where I became involved. I was serving on the board of a group called the Texas Human Rights Foundation. And we were a gay rights organization for the state of Texas. And so we started raising money to fund our appeal to the United States Supreme Court for Baker v. Wade. And we got a distinguished constitutional law scholar from uh, Harvard, uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe, agreed to argue the case for us at the United States Supreme Court. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, the way, the way this got to the Fifth Circuit anyway, Jim Maddox was the Attorney General, and as one Assistant Attorney General told me about the sodomy law, we think we can bend over on this one. <laughs> I swear. So Maddox did not appeal Baker v. Wade. In those days, and it's different now, but in those days, any district attorney in the state of Texas could appeal it. And Danny Hill, from Potter County, Amarillo, appealed it. There were two groups of people who appealed it, Pot uh, Danny Hill and a group of doctors called Doctors Against AIDS. Remember, this is the, when AIDS starts showing up, 83, 84, starts showing up in Texas. It had shown up on the coast in 82, but it was working its way across the country. So we had, we had lined up an advocacy for the United States Supreme Court argument. But the Baker case got coupled with a Georgia case called Bowers versus Hardwick. It was a sodomy court challenge. I want to tell you a whole lot about it. Same issue. These two cases got coupled together. And Bowers got heard first. The United States Supreme Court in 1986 issued an opinion in which the majority of the court repeated every vicious canard ever spoken about gay people from the beginning of time. And that was the law of the land. There was no place to go. There was no use in having Baker heard once Bowers got decided. It was decided the last week of June. Why does that matter? When was Stonewall? June 28th. The last week of June is Gay Pride Week. Does it matter? Is it intentional? I think so. So we slunk home from D.C. thinking we've been poured out badly by the United States Supreme Court. What do we do now? And we thought about it, chewed on it. Where are we going to go? What, what, what do we do now? Well, <clears throat> some lawyers and various community activists got together and said, well, you know, Texas has got a constitution and a separate court system. Let's see what kind of an answer we can get from the Texas court system which on the very, very best day was a crapshoot. <laughs> However, we could educate 
and raised money on these issues for several years. And at least we were not cooperating in our own oppression. Stand up and be heard. Fight back. Don't just roll over. Don't just bow down. So we started a case. And that case was called Morales v. State of Texas. Okay, I'm going to leave this story of the sodomy court, the legal challenges to the sodomy law, and talk about what else was happening at this time. AIDS had overtaken us all. By late 1985, Commissioner Robert Bernstein, who was Commissioner of Health for the state of Texas, proposed this first AIDS quarantine rule in the nation, the first one ever anywhere, because there was a report of a hustler from Minneapolis, and Minneapolis didn't know what to do with him. He was sick. They bought him a bus ticket to Houston. That was their idea of how to handle the problem, was get him out of town. So the question is, what are we going to do with it? So Commissioner Bernstein proposed an AIDS quarantine rule for the Texas Department of Health. It was about three sentences long, very short. It essentially said every health official in every county in the state of Texas has the right to lock up anybody suspected of transmitting AIDS. There was no due process in there, no right to a magistrate, no waiting period, no evidentiary standard, just those few words. And the health department in most counties, the health officer in most counties is the sheriff, which is an elected office with no educational requirements. If you can get the votes, you are the sheriff. So we were afraid that we were facing a time when every man who appeared to be light in his loafers could be locked up in a jail somewhere. We were mostly worried about rural counties, but also urban counties. It could happen anywhere. So once that rule was proposed, we formed a little ad hoc group trying to say, what, what's going to be our response? What are we going to do? And it was uh, Gary LaMarche, who was with the Texas Civil Liberties Union, Jim Harrington now with the Texas Civil Rights Project, Glenn Maxey, who's not a lawyer but really smart about legislative matters because he worked in and around the legislature for years, me, another lawyer named Frank Stinger. It was a floating group, so people came and went. <clears throat> and I was the amanuensis. Just taking notes. What are we going to do? So we got the State Health Department to agree to a hearing on their rule. So we wrote an alternative rule that ran to 25 pages or so, most of which I stole from the California Communicable Disease Act. But it had a right to appear before a magistrate, a right to counsel, some evidentiary standards in it that you had to have AIDS, have engaged in conduct that had a reasonable probability of transmitting AIDS without telling the other person so we set up some standards. It wasn't just this fiat where you could lock these people up, these bad, bad faggots. So we, uh, we, we were going to go to the hearing. And last year I gave an incorrect attribution on this. The person who got... Dr. Matilda Krim from the 
American Foundation for AIDS Research, AMFAR, in New York City, was Glenn Maxey. Glenn was a legislative assistant at the time, uh, I think for Senator Oscar Mazzi in the Texas Capitol. And he called D.C. to say, we've got this coming up and we don't know what to do and who, could, who to get. And they said, you need to try to get Dr. Matilda Krim. She's a scientist and a virologist and she knows about this stuff and we think she'd be interested. So Glenn just called the number they gave him and a woman answered the phone and he explained could you get Dr. Krim and here's the situation and the woman who answered the phone eventually said I'll come it was Dr. Krim had answered her own phone at Amphar which knocked him back because that's a surprise so she came we had on the day of the hearing some ammunition. We had something to say. We'd done lots of work. We had the proposed alternative rule. We brought a scientist from out of town. We had people who were willing to stand up. And I was one of those people. And now I'd been a lawyer <clears throat> and I'd done lots of work where I had my little folder and I commented on proposed administrative rules for state agencies. And it was mostly one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, thank you very much, and you sat down. But this was the first time I ever gave that kind of testimony where I could say, my name is Tom Doyle, I'm a lawyer and a gay man. I'd never done that in public before. I was scared, but I did it anyway. And also Glenn Maxey was not out to the world. He did it on the same day. Why, does that, why, why was that a big deal? Because CNN, ABC, NBC, and CBS had their vans in the parking lot over here around the health department because it was the first AIDS quarantine rule in the nation. And when Glenn Maxey came away from the podium, I was standing to the side. He said, I've got to call Mama before the evening news comes on. <laughs> because he had not talked to his mother. And she lived in Baytown, and he wanted to be sure that he was able to speak to her before the evening news came on. But the, the upshot was that the rule that was proposed was pulled down. And big chunks of what we submitted as an alternative was adopted. Not perfect, but better, 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 way better. We no longer had to be af afraid of being incarcerated for being gay. There, had, there were some other criteria in there. Where did we begin making public policy around the issue of AIDS in Texas? In about 1985 or six, there was a, a House Senate Study Commission in, in the Texas legislature, chaired by then representative, a Republican from Houston named Brad Wright who opened the hearings of this study commission by saying, sodomy is illegal in Texas and IV drug use is in, illegal in Texas. I'm not sure the Texas legislature needs to care about AIDS. That is where we began making public policy and response to AIDS in the state of Texas. Very dark days. Not only were your friends dying, but you had public official who's supposed to be studying the problem saying, why should we care? Tough, tough place to begin. <clears throat> and for the first four or five years of the, the plague epidemic, every dime 
that went to public education about AIDS and prevention of AIDS came off our hip pocket. There was no public money. We paid for it all. Condoms in the bars, sex education. We did everything we could to slow down the rate of death. We couldn't stop it, but we could slow it. All right, let me return now. We've done this little detour about AIDS. Let me return now to the challenge um, to the sodomy law. And remember, we're talking about Morales v. State of Texas. Now, who's the Morales in this case? It's not Dan Morales, who was Attorney General of the State of Texas during part of this. It was a lesbianita from Uvalde, Texas, who lived in Houston at the time we brought the suit, named Linda Morales. We had five plaintiffs, men and women, two from uh, Dallas, two from Austin, one from Houston. We were trying to get as much diversity as we could. We couldn't find a black person who could risk their job to come forward and be a part of this case. So we went forward. We had one Hispanic woman. I would had jobs before, but I didn't have them then. I was semi-unemployed, and so I said, let's do it. Let's go for it. Let's do it. And we won at the, at the uh, trial court level in Travis County in front of Judge Paul Davis. Went to, went to the Third Court of Appeals, state court system. Uh, at the time, the Chief Justice was Jimmy Carroll. He wrote a beautiful opinion in support of us. And then it went to the Texas Supreme Court. And here, there was a problem. The court was changing from Democrat to Republican. And along party lines with one Democratic defection, that court voted against us five to four. And their explanation of it is, was, Texas has a bifurcated court system, criminal matters over here, and civil matters over here, you're in the civil side? No. So there again, you see, we could lose jobs, we could lose children, visitation rights to children, but we could not challenge the statute. We couldn't get a prosecution. So we lost. So we had run the string out. U.S. Supreme Court said no. The Texas Supreme Court said no. What do you do now? <clears throat> well, there was a development. In about 2000, 2003, somewhere in there, in Houston, there was a case called Lawrence versus the State of Texas. And a couple, uh, three guys were sitting around an apartment drinking. And one of them gets jealous of the other guys, leaves the apartment, and goes and calls the cops. One of the guys remaining in the apartment is a black man. The man who went to make the phone call said, there is a black man in that apartment with a gun. Four Harris County Sheriff's deputies come to make the call. Break open the door. Well, there's a black man and a white man, but there's no gun. So those four peace officers arrest everybody and take them to jail. As soon as that arrest was made, a bartender at a gay bar in Houston who was a community activist and a 
social organizer, called gay attorneys and began to organize this case the best they could because it might be a chance to challenge the sodomy law. And the reason it was a chance to challenge the sodomy law is that one of those four peace officers did not like fags. And it was his hard-boiled attitude on the matter that created the perfect case. Because two of the peace officers testified that these men were having sex, but one said they were having oral sex and one said they were having anal sex. Now, I've read that those are very different things. <laughs> and they're not easy to mistake one for the other. But there was the chance to challenge it. And it, once it got to a trial court in Houston, the two men who were arrested, uh, Lawrence and Garner, entered no contest. So the facts in the police report were adopted by the court. That's what happened, whether it actually happened or not. And that, there's a great book about this case written by uh, Dale Carpenter. It's called Flagrant Conduct. It's on your sheet of paper. And he's a University of Minnesota law professor. He went to UT Law School in the 80s. I knew him slightly, not really well because he was a log cabin Republican. <laughs> at the time, uh, but it went to the United States Supreme Court, and in the 17 years since Bowers v. Hardwick, the court had changed enough to turn it around 180 degrees. The court said in the Lawrence decision, not only do we find for the plaintiffs but we find that Bowers was wrongly decided and is here overruled. Very direct, unusually direct language from the United States Supreme Court in an unusually short period of time. time for questions. Yes, time for questions now. If you have any. Yes, raise your hands high and let's take some questions. Would you say your name, please? Catherine Staples, was Lawrence Tribe involved in the second Supreme Court case? No, he, uh, he didn't, he didn't uh, advocate. He attended the arguments because this had been an interest of his, uh, but he wasn't the advocate. Any other questions? What countries have had a better solution to the way this situation has come about? I mean, are they better or worse? Or well, a lot of countries are better now. <clears throat> and surprisingly, it's places like Spain and Mexico City and unusual places that permit gay marriage. Um, I didn't get to gay marriage here because I wasn't involved in that, and it's not yet settled what's going to be the answer. But we have, we gay people have by turns been thought to be sinners, social pariah, criminals, mental patients, traitors to our country, and social jokes. That's been the arc of progress so far. We're not we're not yet to full citizenship. When we get a marriage, maybe. We'll see. Um, I'm sorry. We have another question here. Would you stand say your name? Uh, sure. Mike Ignatowski. I was going to ask you to be optimistic and share with us any thoughts you might have on a timeline for same-sex marriage in Texas. Well, there are two cases pending. Oh, in Texas? <laughs> well, well, I always say you're going to have to send federal troops to Texas. I tell friends of mine who live in other states, it is possible to be a homosexual in Texas, but you cannot be a sissy about it. <laughs> because you're going to have to fight everybody between you and the barroom door when you say it. 
Um, I think it will happen, and there's these two cases pending at the U.S. Supreme Court now. The question is the DOMA case, which was is to me clearly unconstitutional and was a mistake from day one. And it's called the Defense of Marriage Act. It says that the, the U, U.S. the federal government does not have to recognize any same-sex marriage from any state. And traditionally, marriage had been left to the states. Traditionally. It'll come... But you know the sodomy law in Texas that was decided in 2003 by the United States Supreme Court, it's unconstitutional, is still in the Texas Penal Code. There was some light discussion this term of taking it out, but they didn't do it. They didn't do it. I called the Equality of Texas to say, did it happen or not? Because I didn't know. I hadn't kept up with it. And they said, no, not this time. They talked about it, but we'll get it someday. And I said, I'm not pressing you. It doesn't make any difference to me. It's not the law. It may still be printed there. And it's shockingly gross language about who does what to whom and what touches what. I appeared in a musical review in about 1989 in which those of us in that review sang the words to the Texas sodomy law to the tune of Onward Christian Soldiers. <laughs> we meant to offend, and we did. Are there other questions? Yes, there's one right here. Lane Husband, what, what single issue do you see in the future that might be as important as a sodomy law? Probably marriage. That's just the one on everybody's mind right now that because these two cases are pending in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And then there will be things like job protection, which other minorities have. So there, there are other issues, but marriage is the one that's got everybody's attention right now and probably will be next. The sodomy law was a huge. We were we were simp we were no longer branded for being who we are. You couldn't be prosecuted for being gay after the sodomy law was repealed and was unconstitutional. The uh, that question was framed in the Bowers case as is there a constitutional right to sodomy? Well, the answer is no. It should have been framed and was framed in the Lawrence v. State of Texas case. Is there a liberty interest in, one, in the private conduct of one's life without unreasonable interference from the government? And the answer to that question is yes. And there's a whole line of cases having to do with marriage and birth control and lot, stuff like that. The answer is yes. So we saw enough change. And Sandra Day O'Connor voted with the majority in Lawrence, and she had voted with the majority in Bowers v. Hardwick. And it's one of the last major cases she participated in before she retired from the court. Do miss her. Tom, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, I know that, of course, federal law now prohibit, prohibits discrimination in employment. In the private sector, do you find that uh, gay people are faring better, or do you feel that there's still covert uh, employment discrimination? Do you see changes and improvements? There's been improvement. However, there are daily injustices about people losing jobs and <clears throat> losing promotions and not being treated equally at work. So, yes, it's better, but there's a lot of room to continue protections. And Texas is an employment at will state, <clears throat> and 
and it makes it very hard if there's not specific legislation, protective legislation, like race or religion, to uh, get any cover. Let's see, we have time for one, do we have time? Very quick question. Uh, my name is David. First of all, thank you for being here. Uh, it was incredibly interesting. My question is, when you compare the struggle for equal rights for gay people to the struggle for equal rights to, say, people of color or women, do you find that the struggle has been more difficult, about the same, or less difficult, given that, you know, for example, a person of color can't walk out of their house and be anything other than a person of color, whereas people who are gay can be in the closet or not in the closet? How do you think that's affected the struggle? There are differences, <clears throat> and there are similarities. I will say this. <clears throat> I do think the black civil rights struggle is the model and was the hardest to overcome. <clears throat> but no black child ever had to go home to their mother and father and sit down at the kitchen table and say, Mom and Dad, guess what? I'm black. And that happens with every gay child who tells the truth to their parents. And they run the risk in many households of being told, get thee hence, get out of my house. So there's a special sting to this business of gay identity. I don't want to say one is worse than the other, but so there are differences, but there are similarities. And the black civil rights struggle is the model. Tom Doyle, you are a pioneer and on the leading edge of an important civil rights movement nationally and internationally. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And uh, let's give him a big thank you. Thank you for inviting me.